Welcome to the Using the Whole Whale podcast, where we learn from leaders about new ideas and digital strategies making a difference in the social impact world. This podcast is a proud production of Whole Whale, a B Corp digital agency. Thank you for joining us. Now, let's go learn something. Today on the podcast, we are excited to have uh, I, I, like an organization I'm so excited about. I am uh, a, a New Yorker, a Brooklynite to be specific, through and through, and I've known of Hot Bread Kitchen and its rise and its new-ish CEO is here, Leslie Abbey. Leslie Abbey is the Chief Executive Officer, and it, which is incredible. She comes from a lifetime of service, it seems, in the, the New York uh, and New York City specifically nonprofit and government ecosystem. Prior to this, uh, you know, she was the deputy executive officer at, at Covenant House in New York, also the COO there, oversaw 260 staff across seven sites in, in New York. And before that, she program officer at Lantern Community Service, uh, a leader in services for uh, youth leaving the foster care system, also with supportive housing. Prior to that, she was... Uh, maintaining senior positions at uh, a New York City Administration for Children's Services and inside of that and prior to that started at the Legal Aid Society with juvenile uh, juvenile rights practice and supporting uh, youth in the system. It just, you know, I feel like there's an entire episode here of going through an amazing career, but maybe to start, it, it feels like you are working in the entire ecosystem for youth to you know entrepreneurs can you give uh, a narrative throughput of like where you sort of view your work in the social impact sector and how it brought you to hot red kitchen yeah i i ha I, I got my start it's true working with youth and when you work with youth you work with families and when we work with families you work with all sorts of issues impacting families and family life which includes the legal system um, the juvenile justice system, the child welfare system, housing, economic development, behavioral health, medical health, lots of different issues. So by it's culminating in my work at Covenant House, where we had holistic services for young adults from 16 to 24. And so I have really always been, uh, I've always approached the work that I do very holistically because you have to, people are whole people. And if you're going to work with them in one area, you have to be cognizant that there's lots of other pressures and, and issues going on uh, for them in other areas as well. And so I would say that even from my time in family court as a young attorney in Bronx family court, all the way up to today, I have really strived to uh, approach my work holistically. And so coming out of Red Kitchen was just, it's been like a dream, honestly. It is this amazing opportunity to work with women who, you know, tend to be kind of the center of, of, of family life and working with kids is very much about working with women as well. So I've always worked with women, but it's a really interesting and creative way of getting at working with women and families and shepherding economic mobility. And that is through the, what we call vibrant New York City food industry. So we are using food, which of course is like the center of life anyway, for many of us, center of home life, something that love, many of us love to do. And many, you know, women and families sort of gather around and we're using that to promote economic opportunity and mobility for women. And uh, it's been a really exciting year. Yeah. And to clarify, it seems like there is career training, there's food entrepreneurship, there's job placement, there's upskilling. And it's all uh, with this sort of lens of using food and food prep in the industry as a medium, uh, as a medium to uh, develop, you know, this economic mobility, which, you know, it looks like you've just sort of gone upstream, right? If you're starting with supporting a, a youth in the juvenile system, clearly the system, clearly other pieces have, have broken in, in their journey uh, in, in New York City. And as you go further and farther up, you know, it's amazing to see now you're at this, this point where, yes, you help, you know, sort of one family and you can upscale or, or place uh, somebody into a position to make, you know, make their own way. Uh, that has a tremendous downstream effect. So it was just fascinating to me to look at this narrative 
Is that kind of the way you see it? Yeah, I do. Actually, we the word we use that I often use is catalyst. We use the food industry as a catalyst for economic mobility. And you're right, we do it in many different ways. So we hold culinary trainings and do job placement. And our start was uh, in a bakery. We started a bakery in Harlem, which doesn't exist today, but that was Hot Bread Kitchen's start. And we use that as our place of training. Now we do very holistic culinary training, meaning including savory, including baking skills, knife skills. And we place women in jobs all throughout the city, we have more than 200 employer partners, and they span from Google being one of our biggest partners. Um, we place many, many women in their cafeterias, and that comes with all sorts of perks and benefits because they're Google, Google employees, oh. um, and sort of all the way to very small neighborhood bakeries in neighborhoods where a lot of our women come from, and that helps with like their commuting times and so forth. So we really center our programs and our job placements on what women want. And we're not, we're not that big. We're, we're growing tremendously, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But we're, relative to some of the other places I've worked at, we're pretty, we're small. And so we can do things in a much more bespoke way. We can really work very, very closely with the women that we, we support to actually find the right place for them. So we do that out of our base in Chelsea Market. Um, we have this beautiful culinary training facility, which is the old Food Network Studios that was donated very generously to us by Google. We're also partnering with nonprofits outside of Manhattan uh, to hold culinary training in their commercial kitchens. There's many commercial kitchens out there connected to nonprofits that uh, lie dormant for part of the day, and they're very excited to bring culinary training to their communities, but they don't have the expertise. So we are seeking out kitchens um, actively. We had two programs in Brooklyn this year, one in Cypress Hills and one in Bushwick, and we're expanding to the Bronx in 2023, which is great. As you said, we do upskilling. So that is using the food industry as a means of career mobility. So prep cook and entry level is really important because it's a very accessible way for people to start on their journey of economic mobility and get started in the food industry. But I think we all can agree that Entry-level food jobs is probably not where most people are going to want to stay for a long time. And so we have recognized this. And honestly, there's a talent shortage, too, with our employer partners. And so they're looking for upskilled workers as well. We have a wonderful contract with the city with small business services right now. We're launching that in early 2023 to do line cook training and placement in restaurants. So that is an upskilling opportunity, and we're going to be mapping out other ways to do upskilling in the new year as well. And so that's really the culinary job side of it. And then as you mentioned, yes, we also do small business incubation. Uh, We have helped to incubate more than 250 small food businesses owned by women in New York City since our inception about 15 years ago. Um, I love this aspect of our work. I'm an entrepreneur. I've started two nonprofits in addition to all the work that you've laid out that I've done, both of which I've sit on the board of. So those were in in addition to the jobs that I've had. But we help to incubate small businesses. So women come to us, they have an idea, they've been selling food out of their home, they may have been selling it out of a shared commercial kitchen, and they want to take their businesses to the next step. They might want to create e-commerce, they might want to get onto DoorDash, they need access to markets and to capital, and we help them get there. And so that's another really important aspect of our work. I feel like that, you know, I I remember the story of starting, you know, Hot Break Kitchen, how it was originally like a a bakery and grew from there. And uh, the stories of entrepreneurs really do sort of capture your imagination, uh, not to say anything less of, you know, upskilling a a workforce and somebody able to, to move up in the industry. You have set a goal, you know, I was going through your reports, uh, you know, in three years to reach 1,000 breadwinners by, by 2024, I guess is the point of it. it. Can you tell us a little bit more of that? Because I love, you know, for North Stars to be set in, in this way, and it, it's clearly sort of driving some alignment. So maybe you could unpack that for us a bit. Yeah, that is our goal. And we have... Uh, metrics and goals for each year leading up to that. Um, this re- this year, 2022, was a huge growth year for us. Uh, we served, we had 483 women enrolled in our programs this year. Our last biggest year was in 2019. 
That year, we had 199 enrollments. So this year alone, we've grown 132% compared to our biggest previous year. And as 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 the CEO, you know, I, I the the Hopper Kitchen, the board of directors, and the leadership here had crafted a plan for growth, a strategic plan for growth before I arrived. And so I inherited that plan. But it was a huge reason why I came. I love growing programs. Pretty much everything that I've been a part of in my career has gotten bigger because I really love I love smart ideas and I think that if they're smart and they're doing good great achieving great outcomes more people need to know about it and should be invested in it and should uh, be supported by it and so that's um, I really I join things because I think they're excellent programs and I want to see them grow so anyway this year we grew and then over the next few years we have gross metrics our plan next year is to get to 666 enrollments, and that would be a 43% increase in 2023 over 2022, and it goes on from there. Mm -hmm. So you feel like you're on track now to hit uh, a 1,000 breadwinners, and maybe you can define what a breadwinner is, because first off, wonderful branding. Branding, I'm just curious. I'm like, a lot of of things it could mean. Yes, yes. We love all food analogies and food. Uh, food food concepts here at Hopper Kitchen. So we have an advisory committee, for example, that's called our kitchen cabinet, and uh, all of our conference rooms have food names and so forth. So um, we're we're a very food focused group, which is really fun. So really, the growth plan kind of breaks out into those areas that I discussed. We um, have uh, are maxing out our time, our our ability to hold culinary training here at Chelsea Market. This year, we had our culinary fundamentals training, which was that prep cook training. Uh, we had five cohorts of about 25 women each this year. That was a huge jump already in terms of the amount of people being trained. Next year, we are also adding on that line cook program here in Chelsea Market, and that'll go till 9 p.m. every day. I, you know, the team and I have talked about the fact that we have this beautiful facility here. We have the ability to train 30 people at once. We have 18 cooking stations. It's really quite amazing. So we want to use it as much as we possibly can. So next year, on most days, there will be training happening here from about nine in the morning till nine at night. Um, so that's part of the the growth plan. Additionally, is the partnership with the nonprofits around the city. We have more nonprofits than we really have the ability from a budget perspective to work with uh, lined up and asking us to come in to work with them. You know, again, the food industry is just, it's a really accessible way for folks who are not working, who maybe are, who are maybe, you know, you know, first generation immigrants getting back into the workforce. It's like a very accessible way for a lot of people to step into the workforce and kind of figure out what's next. So there's a really great demand for it among these nonprofits. And there's a huge talent shortage and we're seeing salaries go up. Uh, for sure. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. So folks really want to grab onto that. So we have a lot of nonprofits looking to partner with us. As I said, we were we did two of those in the in Brooklyn this past year. We're planning to do a third, but we'd love to be doing even more of that. That's that's totally something we could do if we had uh, the financial resources to do so. And then just secondly is the s- small business programming, which we call HBK Incubates. That's what we call it. This year, we kind of reinvigorated it and it was not surprisingly a little dormant and kind of slow during 2020 and 2021. Not too many people were starting new food businesses during those two years. And so there's really been a resurgence and interest in this work, both by women business owners and also by partners, meaning funding partners and corporate partners. I think that what we're seeing is a real interest and understanding that the flexibility that I think all of us have come to expect and desire coming out of those pandemic years is something that also folks at all levels of incomes are looking for as well. And so for people who did make ends meet by cooking food and selling food to friends and family or in their neighborhood or at pop-ups, they're seeing the benefits of the flexibility and of small business ownership, and they want to see if they can take it to the next level. So to that end, we did virtual programming this year around technical assistance to small business owners, how to do a marketing plan, how to do a financial plan, the legal aspects to cooking at home, et cetera, et cetera. 
all of those virtual, all of that virtual programming, we held it four times this year. It was all oversubscribed. So, oh my God. wait a minute, say that. So you held this uh, we held- open call for entrepreneurs that were like, hey, how do you figure out how to sell that, you know, jerk chicken or, you know, homebrew or whatever you're working on? Yeah, we had, uh, it was classes, really. We call it prep for success. There were six modules. This year, folks had to start with module one and go the way all the way through module six. uh, And it was done synchronously. And each of those classes were oversubscribed. We had more entrepreneurs signing up for those classes than we had space for. Really huge demand. So next year, the new iteration is we're going to break it up into different modules and folks can come in or come out and pick and choose however they want. So you don't have to start on module one and go all the way through module six. If you really only want marketing and legal assistance, you can just do those modules. If you want sort of the first one, which is just like where to start, how to even think about starting a small business, you could just do that one and then decide you're not going to even do it and and move on from there. So again, it just the the response has been huge. And we have, as I mentioned, also seen really great interest in some of our funders around this work as well. So uh, we're working, for example, with Goldman Sachs, who has prioritized small businesses and women-owned businesses and Black women-owned businesses as a priority for them. And that's exactly what we're about. And so, you know, we're partnering with them and and some other funders as well to really promote this work. I mean, it seems like, you know, you, you mentioned the number in 2019 and then there was like seen missing. And then this year, the number uh, that you said in terms of growth for the number of breadwinners or, or folks trained had you know, now eclipsed your previous high. I'm curious, in this period of time, you know, you're, you're training more folks than ever before. In what ways have you seen uh, technology be used to increase your impact? Yeah, that's a great question. And by the way, I think I didn't answer the question about what is a breadwinner. Breadwinner is any members that we serve. And we call them members here at Hopper Kitchen because the idea is once a member, always a member. So any of the women that we support can come back to us whenever they want for any kind of assistance. And that is, you know, one thing I haven't just focused on just briefly before I answer that, that question about technology is, in addition to all of this sort of technical work that we do with them, we also provide what we call an ecosystem of support to all the women that we serve. So we have a licensed social worker on staff and we have case management uh, staffing as well. And so we have an entire team that's there to support the women, however they need. It could be for mental health services, housing services. We have a lot of expertise in accessing childcare and handling working papers. And we have an emergency fund too. So if women need emergency funds to cover childcare or to cover, you know, any kind of uh, sort of moderate, co- you know, expenses that they may have in order to allow them to finish the training and get their themselves placed into a job, we will cover that as well. So it's really important for us. But the breadwinners are all of our members that we serve. Technology. Well, we have, uh, we've, we've made a lot of techno- technological changes this year. A couple of highlights. Uh, we have added translation plugins to all of our intake paperwork. So, and in fact, we also digitized all of our intake. It actually, even when I started, it was on paper, which is kind of amazing because that was not that long ago. So we have digitized everything. But in addition, 75% of the women we serve are first-generation immigrants. So we, got, we have a lot of languages being spoken around here. And in fact, one of the bridge training offerings that we provide is English for uh, speakers of other languages, contextualized for the food industry. So that's a service that we also provide after culinary training in the evenings if women want that. Uh, But to get a stronger and just more robust pipeline of women who may not speak English as a first language, we have uh, used this plug-in system to be able to translate our intake uh, digital paperwork into pretty much any language that a woman needs, which has been great. Other technology that we've used, we are using Envoy, E-N-V-O-Y, for hoteling and for vaccination, COVID vaccination tracking. We are really mostly a hybrid organization, meaning that uh, we have folks coming in sometimes, but not all the time. And so we needed some hoteling apps and we decided to use Envoy for that. Our subheading of our hybrid policy is presence with purpose, meaning we're asking folks to come in 
for very specific purposes, like team meetings, you know, obviously when women are here and member facing staff need to be here, but not to come in just to come in, but really to come in for purposes. And then lastly, uh, as we've been growing and our staff has really tremendously grown, as you can see with all this programming growing, it was really important to me, especially to have a real-time organizational chart. We really didn't have that here. We had one, but it was very static. It was very hard to change. And we're really adding and growing. And I want everyone to be able to see where they are in the context of the organization and understanding like all the different pieces of the pie that's actually making all this work. So we used org Organimi is the uh, uh, tool that we used to keep up with that organizational chart changes. Yeah, and um, I was also curious about the maybe additional, maybe online resources that you potentially develop for supporting your entrepreneurs or sort of out of, out of kitchen learning. Yeah. So, I mean, so far, a lot of it has been really just like Zoom webinar kind of work and, and very much like people speaking to people and, and a little bit less on heavy on the technology. And I would say we've learned a lot this year and our vision for the out years, and this is actually based on some conversations I've had with some of our board members as well, who are experts in this, is to be thinking about utilizing the really the burgeoning uh, field of educational technology. So I think there are there are websites out there and there are almost like universities that are holding classes synchronously, asynchronously, that would draw in a wider network of people than would naturally just come to our website. For and so I think we're, we're going to be looking at that probably in the next year. In a lot of ways, we've thought that we could bring our programming, we can, also, we can make it almost national if we wanted to do that. And so our ideas for the next couple of years are to kind of map that out and to really think about how we might be able to go beyond New York City. Yeah, I mean, it's not hotbreadkitchennewyork.org. It's hot bread <laughs> kitchen. Uh, Correct. And, Correct. You know, the model seems to be working. It's an interesting time that you've stepped in in 2022. You started in January, correct? Of, uh, of our, the current year, we're at least talking in 2022. I mean, what a fascinating time where you see, in some senses, you know, post-pandemic, going a certain direction, but then inflation suddenly undermining a, a lot of progress that some nonprofits were making, at least financially. You know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, you jump into, into this role, the economic landscape is changing. Suddenly there's a huge demand, a huge demand, I think, in the service industry. You know, how has it been balancing uh, those big moving pieces for you in this role? I mean, I, I, I came in sort of instinctively feeling and knowing that there was just a huge amount of opportunity for that reason. I mean, even in January, and frankly, when I started, like Omicron was happening, we started and it felt like two steps forward, one step back right at the very beginning of the year. So it wasn't mm -hmm. exactly the most obvious sort of bang of a start because things were a little shaky at the beginning of this year, as you might remember. But I think even then we were all starting to collectively think about sort of what, what life was going to be like in this third, you know, the, the year after the two years of the pandemic, I think everybody's really itching to kind of work together to try to get the economy back on track, get back together in person, support food workers, frankly. I think that was really recognized, especially in 2021, that that was an in industry that was really vital to New York City and to the country as a whole, but especially to New York City. And that the workers involved were really, you know, were really suffering and that this was an important industry just for the fabric of New York City and also because of the like thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that it affects. And so I, I there's just been a real commitment by funders and by uh, our nonprofit partners and by the restaurant industry that we interact with and all of our employer partners that we interact with to really, you know, make this concept here at Hopper Kitchen work. I think also... Not only are we coming out of the pandemic, but we're also coming out of the protests around policing and racism you know, that happened in 2020. And so, you know, I think the food industry, like many in many industries, has, has really kind of recognized its 
role in addressing inequities that that existed. And so I think they're doing it. Many of, the, of our partners are really want to grapple with these issues with us and really want to be partners because they want to do the right thing and they need some guidance and they need some thought partnership around it. And so they're excited to work with Hot Break Kitchen to think about what those issues mean for the food industry, for their workers and for their teams. And so we have some amazing, you know, high level corporate and much smaller partners, which is very exciting. You know, one of the things I haven't really talked that much about, but is a very important part of our work is our quality jobs initiative. So, you know, I don't, for many of us, like the food industry is not exactly known for having awesome, great jobs, right? And their hard hours are people on their feet pay can be sometimes not as high as we would like. And so we're, we at Hopper Kitchen are very committed to doing what we can to advocate for positive changes in this industry. So to that end, we brought together this year 11 bakeries. Uh, among those bakeries are 800 staff. So they're small and medium sized. There's a lot of people involved, right? 800 staff to use a framework that is put out by an entity called the Good Jobs Institute. And what we're doing with them is mapping on the culinary field onto the template for good jobs that the Good Jobs Institute has put out. And then work with bakeries to implement, select and implement a couple of operational changes each uh, to, you know, to put, put forth into their, into their businesses. And the idea there, too, is that uh, good jobs is good for business. And they're seeing this, They again, they want to not only do the right thing, but they also have a talent shortage. They need to hire workers just like most of us do, and they need to retain workers. Turnover is not helpful to them. So when I started, we were gathering, we were recruiting bakeries into this quality jobs initiative. And to be honest, the team, you know, I was like, no, like, like businesses are going to actually spend time with us to talk about how to change their operations. It seemed sort of far-fetched to me. And the team kind of wondered aloud if we were going to have to give maybe financial incentives to have folks participate. And let me tell you, within a month, we had 11 bakeries signed up right away. No financial incentives, thrilled to be working with us, excited to kind of see what like this would entail. And they've been really committed partners ever since. And so that work has unfolded this year. We are planning to put together a white paper next year to uh, talk through or describe the operational changes that these bakeries undertook, the implementation challenges, what what went well, what didn't go so well. And then another goal is to be holding what we have called previously a kitchen conference in the fall to talk about quality jobs. It's something that, again, also a lot of our funding partners are very interested in because they know that the food industry is important and that there's a lot of people in it, but there really needs to be focus on, uh, you know, whether those jobs are good and how to improve them. Yeah, looking at your 2021 stats, uh, I'm seeing that 81% of placements had access to benefits, which is, you know, not the only, but certainly a very positive marker for uh, a job that can support not only an individual, but a, a family. So that's, you know, pretty amazing. I'm curious, you know, as a, as a small business interested in working with you all uh, in the food services, it's uh, maybe an assumption I have, but I'm curious if Hot bread kitchen uh, trained or folks that have gone through your program tend to have higher retention in the jobs that they get placed at versus, you know, an average piece. I wonder if that's something that folks may be seeing. That's a great question. And I think something we'd have to look into. Uh, so I don't have the answer to that, but I can say that compared to other programs and other nonprofits with, with which I've worked, I think our retention rate is quite high. We are three months out at least in the 70, 75% retention rate, which especially for our food, you know, entry-level food job, I think that's that's quite high. I don't know exactly how it compares to folks who are not, not HBK trained, uh, but to, to us, that feels pretty good. And I'll say we're, we're picky about our employers, even though we do work with 200, that's many, that's a lot. <laughs> so we do turn people down and not because we don't want to be helpful to the food industry, but we want to place our breadwinners in good jobs. And I would say that as we look to 2023, we're going to be probably narrowing that focus even more. If we can place women, 75% of our women into jobs with benefits, we should be able to up that to 85% or 95%, mm. 100%. There's no reason why there should be a 25% rate of 
women without benefits. Same with set schedules. I mean, if we can really find that many businesses that can do it, we can say to other businesses, look, either we need you to meet, you know, have your business meet where your peers are going, or we can't really work with you because this is what the women that we serve deserve. It's a great moment too, I think, on the, the positive side of the, you know, inflation and uh, low, uh, low unemployment is that you, know, you move from a price taker to a price maker where it's clear that there's increased demand and increased need for, you know, specifically in the service industry among others. And so it is, a, you know, it's a really smart time to be, you know, negotiating and pushing for, you know, what you think uh, fair uh, and what HBK, you know, could be guaranteeing for, for women that go through that program. You seem to get really excited about this idea of, you know, obviously doing very well in New York City, but what would it look like to move beyond? And there's just like, you know, a kitchen somewhere, right? There's a kitchen somewhere right now in New Jersey or even California. It's, you know, they have 5,000 square feet and it's, you know, your utilization is out of this world, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. That, that kitchen is working. You know, when you see, you know, there's a, you know, a place in Jersey, say with 5,000, 10,000 square feet of an industrial kitchen that has unutilized time, what would be your approach to saying, here is the HBK way of utilizing that space? Yeah, I think, uh, honestly, I feel like I think the sky's the limit for us. And we have been approached, I mean, already in my first year, I have been approached uh, by people in probably about seven or eight different locations, including outside of the United States, to ask if we would consider replicating HBK elsewhere. And I think the answer is yes, we would definitely consider it, you know, after we really get to what feels like real scale here in New York City. Um, you hear, you've heard about the growth plans, and I think we need a couple of years here to kind of get to get to the growth that New York City can handle. And we have to learn about growth. I mean, one of the beautiful things about HBK, again, compared to is you know many of the other places where I've worked, which are much much bigger than than Hopper Kitchen, is just the incredibly, frankly, the very warm culture among the staff. And between the members, the very targeted, tailored, bespoke way that we work with each other around food production, about food creation with our members to really understand who's the right match for which program, what kind of job will they succeed in, what are employers looking for? That is really important. We spend a lot of time with each employer to understand who will succeed in this kitchen and what are you looking for so that the job placements are, are you know, are, are well received and last. So the point is, is that I am excited to grow. And I would say as we look forward to this year, something that is on all of our minds that our, our team is talking about extensively is how do we grow and maintain that incredibly um, high quality program that is very bespoke and very tailored. And I think we need to kind of learn how to, you know, we need to kind of practice that before we can even, we can think about sort of what's the next city and so forth. But I know we can do it. And I have, you know, as I said, I, I think the sky's the limit and I, I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement and it can be easy to get drawn into expanding before you have maximized your, your, your current model and the way you work and the way you can do it responsibly, especially because you are dealing with presence with purpose, which I love going to steal that. But you're dealing with a need for boots on the ground, which means infrastructure, which means overhead. And I have seen more than once nonprofits that are enticed into expanding for a year into a, you know, another city, into a Detroit, into wherever you may, you know, want to go. And after that funding dries up, the organization is still there and suddenly get caught in this overhead trap of saying like, well, wait a minute, this isn't a self-sustaining entity. It was a one and done grant expansion. And, you know, I think you have to, you know, balance those, those risks side by side because all that glitters isn't gold sometimes. And it sounds like you're like, you know, have that in the back of your mind about like, we can grow, we must grow right. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, many nonprofits need real 
capital space de- facilities to do their businesses, uh, we have a really unique need. Um, you know, right now, as I said, we have a 10,000 square foot kitchen with 18 cooking stations with very expensive equipment and big walk-ins and dry storage and cold storage and lots of hoods and venting and all this stuff. So it's it's a complicated uh, facility that is needed to do this and, and an expensive one. And so I'm just honestly, I'm so grateful to have this incredible space here at Chelsea Market for uh, at least the next few years to kind of give us the space and the uh, just the, the time to really understand what it is that we need and to map out kind of where where we can expand and what would be next. In addition to just figuring out the financing of it all. I mean, it's expensive. It's, the equipment's expensive. The space is expensive. It's a unique kind of proposition. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of sort of real estate finance discussions in my future in the next couple of years, for sure. Yeah. I want to move into our, our rapid fire because I know that there are many end of year things that I'm sure you are racing to finish. I want to touch a bit more really quickly, though, on the, the access to capital because that was it seemed very exciting because you're able to sort of have this incubator, you know, for small businesses vetted, structured, and then you can get them them capital. How do you see that growing? Is there ever a world where I know you can sort of publicly donate on your site? Is there a world where other investors are potentially going to be able to, to see opportunities of, of investing in these entrepreneurs? Yeah. Uh, in the coming year, there's a number of uh, investment funds that have reached out to us uh, that you know, we have connected with, that we ha- we've had connections with over the years that really target women-owned businesses and typically smaller businesses. And so uh, those like investment funds are where we're starting next year. There's about sort of four to five of them that are kind of lined up and we're really mapping out with them how it is that we're going to partner with them and support each other. So that's our, but you know, the women that we serve, especially who are further along in their start, in the starting of their business and or are getting ready to, or, or, or are in the middle of scaling their business. They have all said to us that they 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 need access to capital. There's a phrase that we've heard a few times, which is, "We can, at times they can feel over mentored and under resourced." So we get lots of offers, and we always want offers. They do want mentoring support as well, so we'd never turn that way. But we do have to recognize the reality that they do need an infusion of capital. It's just like the from where they're standing, and and given frankly the challenges as. A woman, an, uh, a woman of color business owner, they just often don't literally have the networks and the access that other business owners do. It is, it's incumbent on us to make those connections. So we're starting with those funds. And then I think time will tell whether we'll be opening up, frankly, our own as a organization's investment into some of these businesses and or whether we'll invite public to, the public to do so as well. Oh, it's super exciting. All right. As we move into rapid fire, uh, excited to get your answers and Quick little sound bites of uh, what we got coming here. What is one tech tool or website that you or your organization has started using in the last year? Well, I think I mentioned, I think the translation plugin was really our biggest uh, coup. I think this year we serve uh, mostly immigrant women using lots of languages. And so being able to translate all of our materials for those women into basically whatever language women need has been hugely helpful. What is a tech issue you're currently battling with? Okay, so I think battling is a strong word, but I would say that we're really refining how we look at, show, and use our data in general. I, it's, a, it's been like a Goldilocks problem, I call it. Sometimes it just seems like way too much detail and too much data, and other times it's like too little detail. And sometimes we find that the data isn't really answering the right question. And it, you know, you can't fix that in days. It can take months to kind of get that right. So I would say this is a big work in progress here at HBK. What is coming in the next year that has you the most excited? Well, I think you've heard me talk about our growth, and I would say that is what's having getting me most excited. I love talking about our numbers and the numbers of women that we're going to be serving. We served 132% more women this year than our last biggest year, which was 2019. And our programs in 2023 grow us 43% bigger than in 2022. So I'm super excited to keep scaling our excellent programs. Can you talk about a mistake that you made earlier in your career that shapes the way you do things today? Well, I think 
Conversely, on the growth, the, the answer talking about be, me being excited about growth, I would say that I have always been really excited to grow programs. And I, uh, you know, I, I know that people do need support, though, to do so. And I would say, you know, I've seen that growth too quickly can really weigh down a team and ultimately be a morale buster because everyone's folks are feeling like they're being pulled in way too many directions and not really understanding the purpose of the growth or what we're actually achieving. So I would say I have gone too fast occasionally previously, and I really now try to be more deliberate. The team here at Hopper Kitchen I've been so thrilled because they are excellent, thoughtful planners, and I'm learning so much from them. And so we're really trying to be as thoughtful and deliberate as we possibly can. Do you believe that nonprofits can successfully go out of business? So I have, honestly, I have not really seen that happen, but I'm not discouraged by that. I think that nonprofits are a critical part of our community. It's like asking whether for profits or the public sector is going to go out of business. I mean, some do, but I think we're really, really an important glue to our fabric, if you will. So I, I have not seen it happen, but I also think that successful nonprofits evolve to stay up with the times and that data, both quantitative data and qualitative data improves what we do. So I think Rather than going out of business, I think we're evolving and getting better at what we do and really improving our outcomes. I would put you in a hot tub time machine back to, I guess, the beginning of this year, the start of your work with Hot Bread Kitchen. What advice would you give yourself? Well, the start of this year, I would say, I, you know, I had, it's funny, I'm, I'm looking back on the goals. My board of directors and I set goals for the organization for myself. Uh, only about six weeks into my tenure here, I've looked back on those and we have accomplished a lot, but I'd say they were, they were lofty goals. So again, I think it's really feeling good about taking the time for planning. I, I kind of tend to want to get to outcomes pretty quickly. And so really thinking through the time it takes to kind of plan out the expansion and so forth. So that would be the advice I would give, which is really think through kind of how long things are going to take and, and, and map out the planning process as well. What is something you think you or HBK should stop doing? So I'm a pretty committed critical thinker. And so I would hope that if there is something that I think we should be we should stop doing, that I would hope that I'd be asking why we're doing it in the first place. And as a new CEO, I definitely have asked that question a lot of times this year. But, you know, as I've mentioned, we 2022 was really a year of a lot of new opportunities for Hopper Kitchen. I was new. We were new into the Chelsea market space. We uh, restarted our culinary trainings programs, which had all been dormant for 2020 and 2021. So we hadn't done any real culinary training in over two years. And we really took kind of a learn as we go approach rather than establishing strict protocols from the outset. So I would say that now that our first post-COVID year is under our belt, we are kind of really evaluating like return on investment on some of the activities that we're doing and a little bit less jumping into things. So just being more clear on why it is we're doing something and kind of what we're getting out of it. I think that's what we're looking forward to this year. If you had a magic wand to wave across the industry, what would it do? So my answer to this was, I really wish that our industry would coordinate efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives. Um, many of us in the nonprofit world are doing great work in this area, but it's all very fragmented and extremely under-resourced. And this is especially true for smaller nonprofits like Hot Break Kitchen. There's only sort of so much we can do out of our relatively modest budget. So I wish foundations or the public sector would put some resources towards coordinating uh, the work that we're all doing. Um, I think it would improve all of us collectively. How did you get started in the social impact sector? I, like I said, I've, I have really prided myself on, on being a critical thinker. So from a pretty young age, I think I asked a lot of questions about why things were and really kind of had a focus on inequity that I was seeing all around me. I grew up in downtown Manhattan in the 70s and you know, New York City in the 70s, there's a lot going on. Um, we were, you know, almost on the brink of financial disaster here and kind of came back from that. But it was, it was, it was, you know, kind of a rough time. And so I really saw that and felt like this was something that I wanted to get involved in. So from early on, I was 
working on, you know, sort of critical thinking issues. I was a women's studies major in college because I wanted to sort of see the world through that the, that frame and have always just wanted to be part of the uh, public interest sector. What advice did your parents give you that you either followed or didn't follow? My father's favorite phrase is, okay, I can't even believe I'm saying this on a podcast, but if my father's favorite phrase is, if you want something done, give it to a busy person, But she now says to my kids as well. So there are times when I feel overwhelmed by all that's on my plate, but I realize that this is actually how I best get things done. And I feel like there's, there's, there's some truth in that. So I have become a lot more efficient over the years, especially as a working mom. And my parents have always been my biggest champions. And I'm so grateful for it. But that is a phrase that comes back to me over and over. It's feeling like more and more like a truism. What advice would you give current college grads looking to enter the social impact sector? Spend time on the front lines. Um, get to know the ground level of any issue you're interested in. Like you, first of all, you might love it and spend your career bringing your talents directly to people who need your support. But if you want to get into scaling programs or systems change work, it's absolutely essential to spend time on the front lines. What is your favorite baked good? Ah, my favorite baked good. Well, let me tell you, coming soon are... Hop Ray Kitchen Hollow Rolls back into production and for sale. So we were just up at the uh, bakery last week, taste testing lots of different hollow rolls. You know, my job is so hard. What can yes, I say? that's a tough one, huh? So I will say at the moment, it's Hop Ray Kitchen Hollow Rolls that are going to be coming to a store near you uh, in 2023. Well, as they say, if you want something eaten, ask a busy person. Uh, exactly. Thank you for your work. Final question. How do people find you? How do people help you? Yeah, please visit us on our website at hotbreadkitchen.org. Um, also, I am on LinkedIn and post a lot about our programs and am always happy to make connections there as well. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for your work and continued success. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here and to be on your podcast. And I'm always excited to talk, to talk about Hot Bread Kitchen. So thank you for the opportunity. This has been Using the Whole Whale podcast. If you want to keep learning more about these topics and others, head on over to wholewhale.com slash university to keep learning with us. Thanks as always to gregthomasmusic.org for his tunes that underwrite our tracks. They're fantastic. Hope you're doing well, Greg. And just a reminder, subscribes really help us on any platform that you listen to us on. Please give a thought to click and subscribe and maybe even a comment because we like hearing from you. 